many people have a favorite Christmas movie. A Christmas Story, Elf, Die Hard, Eyes Wide Shut. But probably the most famous Christmas movie is Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. It's a Wonderful Life was the first film that Capra made after returning from World War II. And for a film that has a reputation for being heartwarming, it perfectly portrays the existential crisis of post-war America with a dark story about disappointment and regret. Before getting to the part of the movie that everybody knows about, where an angel shows George Bailey what would have happened if he never existed. But I'm not going to talk about that movie. The film I am going to talk about instead is Frank Capra's Meet John Doe, made in 1941, before America entered World War II. This film is an inspirational piece of Capra populism about the possible rise of fascism in America and its relationship with capitalism, but it's also a movie that takes place at Christmas and is a retelling of the Christ story. Well, you're wrong. It's no miracle. It's no miracle because I see it happen once every year, and so do you, at Christmas time. There's something swell about the spirit of Christmas to see what it does to people, all kinds of people. Now, why can't that spirit, that same warm Christmas spirit, last the whole year round? Gosh, if it ever did, if each and every John Doe would make that spirit last 365 days out of the year, we'd develop such a strength, we'd create such a tidal wave of goodwill that no human force could stand against it. While everybody knows It's a Wonderful Life, not everybody necessarily knows about the work of its director, Frank Capra. Frank Capra was an immigrant whose family came to the United States from Italy when he was a child. He studied to be an engineer, but was drawn to a career in the movies, where he started as a gag writer and worked his way up to becoming a director. Capra became a major director with It Happened One Night, a low-budget romantic comedy starring Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. It was a huge smash in 1935 and was the first film to win the Academy Awards in all five of the major categories. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Screenplay. The script was written by Robert Riskin, who would become a frequent Capra collaborator. With Riskin, Capra made Mr. Deeds Goes to Town and You Can't Take It With You, two films that also won Capra Best Director Oscars, and established him as an auteur with an interest in populism. In a Capra film, it was the little guy who mattered, and though he was often surrounded by corruption, he would usually win in the end. Capra's film Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is one of the most powerful examples of this, with the naive Jefferson Smith being appointed to the Senate after the death of the sitting senator of his state, and standing up to the corruption he finds there. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington was well received by critics and a big hit, but it was upsetting to the American political establishment who were angry at the suggestion that the U.S. Senate could possibly be corrupt. Capra decided to leave Columbia Pictures after this film. He had clashed with them over a previous film, Lost Horizon, and he was also afraid that they would never allow him to make a film as politically charged as Mr. Smith Goes to Washington again. His first film as an independent producer, Meet John Doe, is perhaps his most subversive film. It is also perhaps the most neglected of his masterpieces, with his 1944 black comedy, Arsenic and Old Lace, being recently released on Blu-ray as part of the Criterion Collection, Meet John Doe is the only one of the great Capra films to never be released on Blu-ray, and it's kind of hard to find on DVD too. Fortunately, because the movie is in the public domain, you can watch it for free on YouTube, a link provided in the description. If you want to watch it before completing this video, just be sure to like and subscribe before you go. In Meet John Doe, a reporter named Ann Mitchell, played by Barbara Stanwyck, comes up with a scheme to save her job after her boss fires several staff members. She writes as her last column a story about a letter she claims to have received from an anonymous John Doe, expressing populist rage at the state of the country during the Great Depression, and claiming he is going to kill himself by jumping off a building on Christmas Eve. The column proves a huge hit with the readership, and concern for John Doe's welfare leads to an outpouring of public support. Anne admits she made the whole thing up to her boss, but also proposes that they continue this ruse. A crowd of homeless men show up claiming to have written the John Doe letter. Mitchell decides to pick one, settling on John Willoughby, an ex-baseball player who says he was hoping to find a job. Willoughby, played by Gary Cooper, just wants to get surgery to fix his arm, so he agrees to go along with the hoax. 
only gradually realizing the extent that he is being exploited when the newspaper's publisher, D.B. Norton, tries to use him as a symbol for a national movement, with the end goal of making himself president. Willoughby decides to expose Norton at a big speech, but Norton hijacks his speech and claims that he had no idea that Willoughby was paid to pretend he wrote the letter. The crowd turns on Willoughby, and he decides to do the thing that the John Doe letter claimed he was going to do, kill himself. So you see, another heartwarming Capra classic. There are a number of interesting things about Meet John Doe within the Capra canon, but the most obvious thing is its politics. As an Italian immigrant, Capra was well aware of the rise of fascism in Italy as it was happening, and World War II had already begun in Europe as the film was being written and produced. The U.S. would be involved in the war by the end of the year, but Capra had created a film about the possible rise of fascism in America. This was one of the things the film was most criticized for when it came out. American critics claimed that fascism could never rise in America. Capra connects fascism directly to capitalism, where media mogul D.B. Norton is shown to have his own squad of uniformed thugs, and he plans to turn the fascination with the John Doe movement into a faux populism that will allow him to control the White House. There are two interesting things about this view of fascism being proposed by Capra. The first is that while other Capra films are odes to populism, this film connects fascism to the a form of astroturfing, where populist values are used as a cover for control of the government by the ultra-rich. The second interesting thing is that Capra critiques fascism as the inevitable result of corporate control of the media. Norton wants to be able to control the populace by his newspapers, but that alone is not enough for him. He thinks that only by having direct control of the presidency, he will have enough power. But Capra wasn't exactly some far-left revolutionary. In fact, Frank Capra wasn't even a Democrat. Frank Capra was a Republican, and he actually objected to much of the policies of the New Deal. Therein lies the contradiction in Capra's work. Some of his films show an outright disdain for the rich, yet Capra, the child of poor immigrants who made good, was the epitome of the American dream. Despite the view presented of fascism as an inevitable result of unchecked capitalism, Capra's film is odd in that it predicts the trajectory of the American right, but seems to think that fascism can be resisted through something other than the upheaval of the system. I often like to compare Frank Capra to one of my favorite directors, Preston Sturges. Sturges began a comedy like Capra, but instead of moving to more dramatic work, he wrote acidic satires of American institutions. While Capra believed in the American dream, Sturges mocked it. Unlike Capra, Sturges was born wealthy, and his films portrayed the moneyed elite as buffoonish and out of touch. Of the two men, Sturges was the one whose politics were generally left-leaning, while Capra's populism relies on the belief of the goodness of common people overcoming corruption. Sturges was more cynical. You see the symbolism of it? Capital and labor destroy each other. It teaches a lesson, a moral lesson. It has social significance. Who wants to see that kind of stuff? It gives me the creeps. Tell them how long it played in the music hall. It was held over a fifth week. Who goes to the music hall? Communists. Communists? This picture's an answer to communists. It shows we're awake and not dunking our heads in the sand like a bunch of ostriches. I want this picture to be a commentary on modern conditions, stark realism, the problems that confront the average man. But with a little sex. A little, but I don't want to stress it. I want this picture to be a document. I want to hold a mirror up to life. I want this to be a picture of dignity, a true canvas of the suffering of humanity. But with a little sex. With a little sex in it. How about a nice musical? How can you talk about musicals at a time like this with the world committing suicide, with corpses piling up in the street, with grim death gargling at you from every corner, with people slaughtered like sheep? Maybe they'd like to forget that. Then why do they hold this one over for a fifth week at the music hall? For the ushers? It died in Pittsburgh. Like a dog. What do they know in Pittsburgh? They know what they like. If they knew what they like, they wouldn't live in Pittsburgh. That's no argument. If you panted the public, you'd still be in the horsey. You think we're not? Look at Hop Along Cash. You look at them. We'd still be making keystone chases, bathing beauties, custard pie And a fortune. Fortune. Of course, I'm just a minor employee here, Mr. LeBrand. He's starting that one again. I wanted to make you something outstanding, something you could be proud of, something that would realize the potentialities of film as the sociological and artistic medium that it is, yeah. with a little sex in it, something like Something the... like Capra. I know. What's the matter with Capra? Sturgis never proposed any solutions to any of the problems that he satirized in his films. He saw his role as primarily as an entertainer, and Sullivan's Travels is a film that most epitomizes that belief. However, he obviously thought that his films could shine a light on the problems that Americans were facing after the Depression and World War II. Capra always thought his films needed some kind of solution. 
but he didn't have a clear solution to how to resist fascism in America. Capra struggled with the ending of Meet John Doe. The film followed a structure that was a retelling of the Christ story, which meant the obvious ending would have been for Willoughby to die, but his death to inspire a resurgence of the John Doe movement that D.B. Norton couldn't control. Capra thought that ending was too bleak. The use of Christian themes throughout Meet John Doe isn't incidental and not exactly subtle. You're the fake. We believe in what we're doing. You're the one that was paid the 30 pieces of silver. Have you forgotten that? Well, I haven't. Ladies and gentlemen, this certainly looks like the end of the John Doe movement. Oh, boys, you can chalk up another one to the Pontius Pilots. Capra connects the concept of solidarity to love thy neighbor and with Christianity, and the suicide of John Doe with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. This is interesting in that Willoughby is a fraud and the original conception of the John Doe movement is based on a lie. But at the same time, Capra connects Christianity with populism. I'm not sure how thought out all this is. Capra might have just thought that his allegory made sense for the story. But it is easy to see the film as stating that Christianity is not literally true, but does reflect some beliefs and values that are at the core of Capra's populism. Capra shot four endings before arriving at the one he actually used, which came through a reshoot. It remains somewhat polarizing. I wouldn't do that if I were you, John. It'll do you no good. The mayor has policemen downstairs with instructions to remove all marks of identification you may have on your person. You'll be buried in Potter's Field and you will have accomplished nothing. I've taken care of that. I've already mailed a copy of this letter to Mr. Connell. John, why don't you forget this foolishness? Stop right where you are, Mr. Norton, if you don't want to go overboard with me. I'm glad you gentlemen are here. You killed the John Doe movement, all right. But you're going to see it's born all over again. Now, take a good look, Mr. Norton. John! John! Oh, John, no, no, I won't let you unlock it, darling. Oh, please. Please don't give up. We'll start all over again. Just you and I. It isn't too late. The John Doe movement isn't dead yet. You see, John, it isn't dead or they wouldn't be here. It's alive in them. They catch it alive by being afraid of that's why they came up here. Oh, darling. Sure, it should have been killed. It was dishonest. Oh, we can start clean now. Just you and I. It'll grow, John, and it'll grow big because it'll be honest this time. Oh, John, if it's worth dying for, it's worth living for. Oh, please, John. Oh. Oh, please, please, God help me. John, John, look at me. You want to be honest, don't you? Well, you don't have to die to keep the John Doe idea alive. Someone already died for that one. The first John Doe. And he's kept that idea alive for nearly 2,000 years. It was he who kept it alive in them. And he'll go on keeping it alive forever and always. For every John Doe movement, these men kill a new one will be born. That's why those bells are ringing, John. They're calling to us. 
Not to give up, but to keep on fighting, to keep on pitching. Oh, don't you see, darling? This is no time to give up. You and I, John, we... Oh, no. No, John, if you die, I want to die, too. Oh, oh, I love you. Oh, <laughs> John. I always thought the ending worked, but I've heard opinions from many people who think it ruins the film. The original ending was for John Willoughby to jump to his death and for the film to end with his lifeless body being cradled by his friend, played by Walter Brennan. Of all the alternate endings of the film, this is the only one I could really see as being adequate, but it would be awfully bleak for a Capra picture, and he, of course, was never comfortable with using it. Both the original ending and the one that was used are the only ones that fully commit to the idea of fascism being opposed by populism based on Christian values. One alternate ending had D.B. Norton having a change of heart, and another had Norton winning in the end. Both of these are obviously worse endings than the one Capra actually used. The film's ending works for me because it focuses on the change that occurs in the character of Anne Mitchell. At the beginning of the film, she is struggling like everybody else. She supports not just herself, but family members. But when things get really bleak, she becomes an opportunist. If this John Doe idea was yours, huh? Yes, Edward. How much money do you get? $30. $30. Well, um, what are you after? I mean, what do you want? A journalistic career? Money. Money? Well, I'm glad to hear somebody admit it. It's through her helping to organize the John Doe movement that she transforms from faux populist to actual populist after being affected by the naive innocence of Willoughby. Another interesting thing about Meet John Doe that I couldn't figure out where to put elsewhere in this video is that it's the Capra film that most explicitly alludes to the connection between capitalism and racism. In the scenes with Norton at his home, Capra contrasts Norton's worldview with that of his servants, some of whom are portrayed as people of color. Films of this period usually portray household servants of the ultra-rich as either all-white or as minstrel stereotypes for comedic effect, so this seems to be an intentional choice by Capra. I also noticed a detail that might not be intentional. At the rally that D.B. Norton organizes for Willoughby, the crowd is singing Oh Susanna, a popular song that originated as a minstrel song, with its original lyrics including racial slurs. If this choice was purposeful, Capra seems to be connecting Norton's fascism directly to American racism. That's the frustrating part about this movie. The film seems to be portraying capitalism as a system that supports racism and leads inevitably to fascism, but its solutions to this problem is for decent everyday people of America to be more kind and supportive to, of their neighbors. Capra, as a conservative himself, just couldn't get over that line where he could propose doing away with the system that he personally benefited from. This is part of the critique of Capra that I think the Coen brothers have in their film, The Hudsucker Proxy. That film portrays Norval Barnes, a naive business school graduate who starts at the bottom of the Hudsucker Corporation but has big ideas. I got big ideas. I'm sure you do. For instance, take a look at this sweet baby. I developed it myself. Yes, sir, this is my ticket upstairs. You know, for kids. The Coens borrow plot elements from Capra, and specifically from Meet John Doe and Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. The film opens with Norville about to commit suicide by jumping off a building, and then flashes back to tell the story of how he got there. Like in Meet John Doe, Norville is the pawn of a corrupt businessman who wants to use him for his own purposes. The female lead character is a reporter, like the lead in both Capra movies, but she pretends to be somebody else to get closer to Norville. Just like Jean Arthur's character, Babe Bennett, pretends to be someone else to get close to Longfellow Deeds in Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. The Coen's film mocks capitalism, but they also mock the entire American dream narrative that Capra uses in his films. They intentionally use magical realism devices to resolve the plot, with an angel and magical narrator serving as deus ex machinas at the film's end. The film rides a strange line of being an homage to Capra and also a parody, and you get the sense that the Coen's like Capra films, but kind of feel bad about it. 
this is the thing about Capra. His feel-good elements tend to work because he was smart enough to contrast them with the dark realities Americans were facing during the Great Depression and World War II. Like many great movies, his best films are products of their times. We can't recreate them because they exist both in an America that no longer exists and in a perception of the American mythology that never existed in the first place. Yet his films still have a power to compel us back to them. I personally find Meet John Doe to be extremely relevant in the early 21st century, where income inequality is high and even a worldwide pandemic couldn't make our politicians behave in a way outside of the interests of big corporate donors. Capra's films may not offer solutions, but they give us hope that they exist and that people can unite and find common ground in order to work toward them. We're with you, Mr. Doe. We just lost our heads and acted like a mob. What We'd... Brett's trying to say is that we need you, Mr. Doe. There were a lot of us that didn't believe what that man said. We were going to start up our John Doe Club again, whether we saw you or not, were we, Bert? And there were a lot of others that were going to do the same thing. Well, Mr. Sharpless even got a letter from his cousin in Toledo. And I got it right here, Mr. Doe. Only, only it'd be a lot easier with you. Please. Please come with us, Mr. Doe. Long John. Mr. Doe. Here, Will, help me with it. She'll be all right. Mr. Doe, take her right down to the car. Right up. We got a car right down to the They are Norton, the people. Try and lick that. Oh. 